I'll let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be made acceptable in my sight, O God, you are our strength and our Redeemer. Bless us now in this preaching moment for your glory, Lord, that your word go forth never to come back void, but accomplish the purpose for which it is sent. And that these words, O God, work toward the healing of this nation. In the name of Christ we pray. In God we give you thanks. Let every heart say together, Amen. Please remain standing and turn with me to the book of Isaiah, the 11th chapter, and I shall read for you hearing a singular verse, verse number 6, Isaiah, the 11th chapter, and verse number 6. from the New International Version as he appears on your screen. The wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The scripture as it is written, and it is always our prayer, God will bless us in the reading and the hearing of his most holy word. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord and each other. And as you take your seat, I ask that you would reach out and take at least one somebody sitting within arm's reach of you and take them by the hand and say to them, Friend, it's a shame when our children have to call us on our BS. Hans Christian Andersen's iconic tale entitled The Emperor's New Clothes. The story is told of a fictitious land where they had a narcissistic and hedonistic king who was obsessively preoccupied with his wardrobe and his outer appearance so much so that he not only wore new clothes every day but he had a new outfit for every hour of every day his seamsters and seamstresses and tailors were frantically busy 24 hours a day around the clock weaving the patterns to don him a new outfit because of his infinitely expansive ego and inexhaustible vanity, he was a lover of extravagant clothes with bold patterns, wild colors, and excessive accessories. It reached a point where he exhausted the creativities of the tailors of the land and the resources for even making new clothes. So someone came up with the idea that they would pretend that they had the outfit of all outfits, the most extravagant that there ever was, and, and but that it was invisible. And make him, and they believe that if they just said it over and over again, even though it was not true, they could convince him it was true. And he would act as if it was. When the king came in to the tailor's workstations to see this new outfit, the fairest and most extravagant that they had ever prepared for him, and said, see your highness, there was nothing there and he spoke aloud there is nothing there they said oh yes king just keep looking and as he kept looking seeing nothing but continuing to hear them say that it is the fairest and most extravagant of all after a while they said it 
until he began to believe it. And once he began to believe it, he began to behave it. And as they put this fictitious outfit on him, he stood uprightly and he began to prance and to pray as he was pleased with his new outfit. So much so that they called a national parade and the citizenry were all gathered. His chambermaids and chamberlains helped him get dressed in this fake outfit that he believed to be true. They too at first saw nothing but as they were told over and over again that it was something they too began to believe it and began to behave it and began to act as if they were actually dressing him and buttoning him and robing him and tying the sash around him the parade began and as he preened down the street Chamberlains even followed him pretending to carry the train that was not but they believed it was the crowds who had gathered had been told in advance that the king would appear in the fairest and most extravagant of all outfits they had been told so many times that their belief that he was wearing an outfit mattered more than their eyes telling him that he was wearing nothing at all. And so as the king strutted in what he believed to be a new outfit and the chamberlains carried the train that they believed that they were carrying, the crowd stood and wildly applauded the new outfit they believed he was wearing until a child finally at last young enough to be seated on the lap of a parent too young to have in, been indoctrinated and internalized the rationalizations and the justifications uh, of the adults simply in the words of the prophet Tupac said I just call it like I see it and blurted out, he's naked. <laughs> or as black folks say it, naked. <laughs> and as the father of the child proudly repeated it, and those around them heard it, and it snapped them out of their gaze. And the hypnotic state that they were in because of the repetition of the lie, a murmur started in the crowd. And a whole new conversation began that started from a child who blurted out what the adults were in too big of a daze to say. It is a sad day when adults are so deafened and so blinded and so hypnotized by their own BS that a child has to step forth and say what adults are not willing to say or see or hear or speak and on yesterday we saw a marvelous demonstration where in my opinion God himself raised up a new prophet in the land and our children are beginning to lead us in the fight against a unique American curse. A nation where the greatest threat to its public health and safety is not no Arab, no radical jihadist, but it is another American with a gun. We average over 12,000 gun-related homicides a year throw in suicides and accident over 30,000 gun deaths per year we had two deaths related to a radical jihadist immigrant last year how many laws did we pass to stop them 
And yet, there has been no response from those who have the power to take the action that can begin to stem the tide of the bloodletting in American society. Only predictable, well-rehearsed BS. Guns don't really kill people. People do. Then let's send our soldiers into battle unarmed. What you need is a good guy with a gun to stop a bad guy with a gun. P.S. There is no data showing that there's a correlation between excess to guns and murder. P.S. That there is nothing we can do to change the laws and the rules or that it is too early to even be talking about gun reform. B.S. It is a sad day when our children have to lead because the adults from the president to the politicians and even the preachers in local pulpits who preach guns with more conviction than they preach grace. Like your Franklin Grahams and your Robert Jeffries and all of the other tyrants passing as pulpit ears. And the children have to lead. When children have to lead us, it is the most scathing indictment that our adult population has become dysfunctional. And our children's childhood in part is stolen. Because now they have to provide for themselves what we as adults are obligated before God to provide for every generation of children. Most basically, we adults are obligated before God to provide our children with, with shelter, sustenance, and security. Anybody who's read any sociology, psychology, one-on-one knows in Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of human needs that at the base level of human need, there, there is shelter, sustenance, and safety. Before you can get to things like education and enlightenment and self-esteem and, 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 and self-awareness um, and as high aspirations, you first have to provide children with shelter, sustenance, and safety. And, and, and when children are not provided that, the, their brains literally function differently when they have to step out of the protected canopy of a village that takes care for them and take care of themselves. It is evidence of the the dysfunction of the adult population and, and, and the stolen childhood because of adults who are more filled, who have lost, something has broken down in the nurturing systems because they have become mesmerized, blind and deafened by their own BS. I remember one of the saddest sights I ever saw when I was pastoring in First Shiloh Baptist Church in Buffalo, New York. And... Um, we were locking up for the day and the church custodian, uh, Dennis King, knocked on my door. It was a Saturday. I was preparing for Sunday morning and uh, like I did every Saturday. And he knocked on my door. He said, Reverend Kent, I got to show you something. And we went out of my office. We went downstairs uh, and I went out into the narthex area of the church. And there was a little child. It was about 12 year old, about this high. And... Um, the child was filthy, not dirty, Steve, filthy. The clothes were filthy. It was clear his body had not touched water or soap in God knows how long. And I could smell him as soon as the door to my office was opened, though he were many, many, many feet away. He had been found by Dennis King, the church uh, custodian, uh, hiding in a cabinet underneath the counters in the church kitchen. He had slipped into the church while they were unloading some supplies with the intention of staying there 
until everyone left so that he could rummage through the church for food. He was caught by the custodian making his final checks when he heard something in the kitchen, thought it was a rodent, found it was a child that was starving and filthy. I told him, I said, we got to call CPS. When I went in my office to call CPS, Dennis had turned his back for a second. The child bolted out the door, escaped into the neighborhood, and there was nothing we could do. About 20 minutes later, Phyllis, the doorbell rang. The door was open. Dennis knocked on my door again, Reverend, there's something you need to see. I said, what is it? I'm trying to get ready for tomorrow morning. He said, there's something you need to see. And Dr. Pedro, that same child was back holding two children in his arms. Two others who were standing, his brothers and sisters. He had went home to get them, to bring them back to the place that made him food. And when we did call CPS, they went to the house and they found a drug-addicted mama laying in her own bodily fluids on the ground along with some piece of man standing beside them, needles all over the ground. And here this oldest child who, 12 years old, could not read, could not write, starving, who was not dirty but filthy that I could smell him long time before I saw him, was now in the parent role. Because those who were parents were so caught up in a degrading and demoralizing life that the, their childhood was stolen. The dysfunction of the results stole the childhood of the child who now had to step in a role and try to do for themselves what adults were refusing to do because of their BS. And most of us in here are filled with righteous indignation over what kind of parent would allow themselves to get so caught up in a life of drugs and degradation that you would leave your children in that situation. And here we are in a country that wants to be great, again, continue to, however you want to look at it, and we would leave our children to now have to fight their own fight for safety. Because we are locked into our political positions, our financial commitments, our ideological extremes, our personal narcissism. Yes. That now our children believe that ain't nobody going to fight for their lives but them. When children have to lead, it's an indictment that the adults have become dysfunctional with their own BS and the childhood of the the childhood of the children in part is stolen. Well the question becomes how did we become so dysfunctional? This past week um, Mr. Eddie Claude uh, who is the Dean of African American Studies at Princeton University he said, we got to peel this onion and see is what is at the re heart of the recalcitrance in Amer Americans' resistance to address this unique American problem of gun violence. Because as you heard in the prophet Emma Gonzalez's speech, Japan has yet to have a mass shooting. We've had 17 since the beginning of the year, and it's only the middle of February. And a mass shooting is defined as any shooting where there are at least four fatalities involved in a single incident. And he says, number one, the reason why um, we cannot get any movement on this issue because we keep starting the conversation in the wrong place. We keep starting our conversation about our gun laws, our ridiculous, outrageous gun laws, by saying, I'm, while I'm a supporter of Second Amendment rights, but, and the question I ask people is, why do we assume that the Second Amendment as currently interpreted is immutable law? Yeah. Kenneth Smith, author of the book, In Search of a Beloved Community, which searches the intellectual sources of 
Martin Luther King Jr., who had been a student of Kenneth Smith. He says that uh, where one ends in ethics making, ethics is how do I behave in light of what I say I believe. Theology is what I believe. Theology, understanding of God. Uh, ethics is the byproduct of theology. How the, give it, theology tells you what I believe. Ethics says how do must I believe in light of what I say. I believe. How must I behave in light of what I say I believe? It, what is the ethics of this country? And the reason why our ethic around guns is so screwed up, because he says, is that where one ends is largely determined by where one begins. If you begin in the wrong place, you're probably going to end up in the wrong place. And when you start the conversation with deference to a 18th century law based upon historical factors that are all gone, We've started conceding something as a fact and immutable that maybe we need not concede. There was a time when people assumed that uh, before the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, slavery would be there forever. That's just the way that it was. There was a time when people assumed women would never have the right to vote until the 19th Amendment, which didn't happen until 1921. But there was a time when people stopped considering that slavery and second-class citizenship for women was immutable law. And if we could change the reality regarding women and regarding slavery, why can't we change the reality when it comes to guns? We've got to start the conversation. Stop conceding. I am not a believer that in this country a right of citizenship is to bear a gun. Why? When you consider that the reason why it was the Maryland and the Virginia colonies that insisted, led by people like uh, George Washington, says every man should have a gun, he meant every white man, because the black codes outlawed a black man from having a gun or to ride a horse. He couldn't ride a horse because then he could get away. He couldn't ride, have a gun because then he could defend himself. And the worst thing, the, a white man's worst fear was to have to look down the barrel of a black man holding a gun. But that was our daily reality. So it was never intended for us, and nor was it intended for women. Um, but George Washington said every man should have a gun, but Maryland and Virginia had the largest slave plantations and the largest uh, slave population in, per capita in comparison to the white population. And the four factors that drove them insisting that if they were going to support the Bill of Rights that the Second Amendment had to be in it was number one, because they reasoned that with the gun they could form militias that would help them free themselves from the colonial control of England, the largest and the strongest army and navy in the world at the time, and that two, they could avoid the reconquest of the British, uh, number three, that with the gun they could dispossess the native peoples of their land from sea to shining sea, the Navajo, the Cherokee, the Apache, the Seminole, the Duwamish, the Puyallup, the Seneca, Indi all the hundreds of tribes that they could dispossess them of their lands because a bow and arrow was no match for a musket. Fourthly, that they then could import the Africans and subject them to a life of chattel slavery because they would live, we would live our lives literally at the barrel of a gun. What did Weldon Johnson called it? Days when hope unborn had died. And fifthly, actually there was a fifth reason that in the westward movement going west in the land grabbing, that they had to be prepared in the frontier. They had to be prepared to defend themselves against other settlers who were grabbing for the same land and without sheriffs and without local police, you couldn't grab and hold any more land than you were able to defend. So from the standpoint of a white man in the 18th century, I understand why they believed that they had to have a gun to free themselves from their own colonizers and to steal the land from the Native, Amer Native Americans and to force slavery on other people and to defend themselves against other white folks with guns. Now that all those factors are gone, the only thing left is this romanticized, fantastic notion about there is no real patriotism without a gun. And as a result, America uniquely has a problem with death at the hands of guns. 30,000 per year. Isn't it interesting that every other manifestation of threat to public health and safety was responded to by the passing of laws? We um, 
when automobiles became a problem with death on the highways seatbelt laws increasing the requirements to even get a license manufacturers had to make cars differently some of us complained it seemed like cars are always total that was by design so that upon impact the car would absorb the energy and would fold like an accordion so that the car absorbed the energy and not the passengers in the car because formerly they were built for the car to withstand the accident but the people in it died because their bodies absorbed the energy so they flipped it the car will fold like an accordion you will walk away and praise God that somebody had sense enough to change how cars were built to protect human lives Huh? Anybody who's a caterer knows that the health inspectors require that you have to keep certain foods at a certain temperature of coldness. The water has to be at a certain temperature of hotness to kill bacteria because if you don't, people's lives can be at risk and health can be at risk. We, and now we almost go through body cavity searches to get on a plane after 911. Every instance of threat to public health and well-being has been followed up on by new laws and new regulations to protect Americans and yet the leading cause of death in America there is not a single response that's BS there is no reason why any civilian should be allowed to have military grade weapons an AR-15 has, a, has a, a magazine clip of at least 33 rounds that it can fire off in 30 seconds if it's fully automated. It's intended for one thing to kill as many people as quickly and as efficiently as you can. You can't use them for hunting. You don't need it to fend off a burglar. And why would a civilian in a non-military setting need military grade weaponry? That is BS. And your hedonistic, narcissistic fantasies about why you need to have such weaponry should not trump my need to be safe from the neighbor next door who may not take their medication. As Obama said, we may not can stop killing, but we can stop mass killing. As Emma said, he couldn't have killed that many people with a knife. Nor a six shooter. And if the shooter in Las Vegas in October had had a six shooter, he couldn't have killed 58 people and left 812 dead. It was because as a civilian, he could get stockpiles of military grade weapons with infinite rounds of ammunition under the auspices of the Second Amendment, right? Most people defend the Second Amendment if you ask them on the spot to quote it. They can't quote it. They're defending something that they don't know. They're defending a myth, a mindset. It's the shortest of all amendments. A well-regulated militia, comma, necessary for the preservation of a free state, period, the right, or semicolon, the right of the citizenry to keep and bear arms shall not be abridged. The second word in is regulated. And yet the current rhetoric is that if we take by bump stops, if we have universal background checks, if we make limitations based upon mental health, what will they take next? We're on the slippery slope. When even as it reads, it says not only regulated, but well-regulated, malicious. Ain't nobody in here in a militia because the sun has set on the British Empire. We are no longer held in bondage other than prisons. And Geronimo, Cochise, and Sitting Bull, you put them on reservations long time ago. The only thing left is this obsessive, compulsive, ridiculous notion that there's no such thing as American citizenship without a gun. That is BS. And if you don't want to listen to me, listen to your children. The children whose bodies were ripped in half by the AR-15 at Newtown at five and six years of age. Almost all of them had that closed casket funerals. They weren't old enough to raise their voices. And now there's an army of digitally armed soldiers. Whose childhoods are being stolen. Who cannot function. Who cannot focus on their trigonometry and their history and their civics lessons. Because they're wondering who's coming through the door.
Eddie Claude, again, the Dean of African American Studies at Princeton University. He said one of the other things we have to deal with is this, and it's related to number one, this, this, this toxic masculinity in American society. Yes, yes. A society that historically has featured this rugged individualism. We don't need the government to protect us. We will protect ourselves. That was the mentality of the frontiersman. He said, well, the AR-15 is the weapon of the modern-day minute man. Some of whom believe in the words, of the, 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 the final words of the Constitution, that if the government should, should, should overreach its powers and not fulfill its responsibilities, we have the right to tear down this government and replace it with another government. And there are people who believe that they're going to stockpile weapons. One of the things they'll say that we need these weapons for is that if we ever end up in a shootout with our government, we've got to be properly armed. Listen, listen, listen. The notion of an armed battle with the government made sense in the 18th century when you talk about musket to musket. Well, now the government has drones and the government has rocket launching helicopters. The government has nuclear weapons. The government has night goggles. The days of thinking you're going to take this government down with your weapons at home are long gone. And uh, I don't know if you just yourself are psychotic or you're not paying attention, but you can't outgun this government. Not in the 21st century. That was an 18th century proposition. Not a 21st century proposition. Come on, keep the text in the context or you may be functioning from a pretext. You can't beat this government with bullets. You got to beat it with ballots. Huh? And so here we are. This sense of Rugged individual is this sense of I'm a man because I own a gun. Where did that come from? How distorted a sense of masculinity that you feel that it's your right as a man is to have a gun because almost exclusively these shooters and these mass killings have been young white males with a few exceptions but generally speaking there have been only one female in the last two decades involved in a mass shooting. This is a male thing and it's a young male thing and almost exclusively a white male thing. And if that bothers somebody, listen, listen, as a black man, the most analyzed and scrutinized and studied segment of the American population, Moynihan said in 68, we're a tangle of pathologies. Listen, if folks can dissect us down to our DNA, it's time to talk about why are white boys so crazy? What is going on? Y'all want to talk about what's going on with black folks when Bloods and Crips are leaving a trail of blood in the neighborhoods on the south side of Chicago? What's wrong with young white boys in America? And what's wrong with white culture and that you're producing a homicidal young man who's turning schools into killing fields and houses of worship into blood baths? And the day at the mall, like yesterday when South Center was shut down and Carissa had to text me and say, Mom's out at the mall with Alana and they're locked up on the third floor of Nordstrom because there's some people with a gun. And we defend that BS. What is going on in the development of manhood? Well, you don't see yourself a man or a patriot without a gun and then we try to wrap that in the gospel we try to wrap the flag around some people even tried to hide behind the cross on it as if we're the old Spanish conquistadors that had the sword in one hand and the Bible in the other a musket in one hand the Bible in the other a six shooter in one hand and the Bible in the other a Tommy gun in one hand and the Bible in the other a nine Glock in one hand and a God in the other an Uzi in one hand and the Bible in the other and now an AR-15 in one hand and the Bible in the other as if the Bible said Jesus was the prince with a peace rather than the prince of peace <laughs> who said that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal and if you live by the sword, you shall die Amen. by the sword. That's 
But think, but, 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 but thirdly, Mr. Claude, and I'm quoting him, it is Black History Month. It's the one month of the year where folk who ignore us all year long act like they're listening to us in the shortest month of the year. So since you act like you're listening to us, I'm going to talk to you. He said, finally, we got to follow the money. This conversation is not an honest conversation about the right to bear arms. It really is a conversation about the right to sell arms. Because the weapons munitions, whose political arm is the NRA, they just want to sell arms. They put $30 million, you said, they put $55 million into the last election on um, Meet the Press this morning. $55 million in the last election, the NRA put into the election, $30 million went to Trump. Governor Scott of Florida, over $10 million. Senator Rubio, over $5 million. And at every level, they have bought public officials to win their elections and who are afraid of running against somebody else heavily funded by the NRA to run against them and run endless ads will not speak against this issue because of the money. And all the weapons industry wants to do is simply sell more guns. That's all they want to do. Now politicians, they just want to win the next election. All that rhetoric about we as Americans being together and all that, that's to manipulate you. They don't believe that. If you think these politicians believe what they say, And if you think Trump believes what they write for him to say that he won't stay on script. Because first of all, he can't write and he can't half read. Then you're sorely mistaken. Tom DeLay, who allowed the former weapons ban to lapse, he did so because he received a big check from the NRA. Politicians continue to give legislative lap dances to their deep-pocketed clients from the weapons industries. The political prostitution is obscene. They make Stormy Daniels look like a rookie. She ain't the only one selling herself. And Donald Trump ain't the only one buying. We've seen the corporatization of American democracy. Ain't nobody representing us at the table with our well-being in mind. And we have found that checks from the NRA trump common sense and trump concern for public safety every single time. And until we dare take the money out of the politics, which the Supreme Court, conservative leading, the Scalia Court, gave us Citizens United we said money is speech so that's how gangsters talk with money to trump your little vote to trump your little gun donation and pouring in money that doesn't then have to be identified where it came from Until you get the money out of politics, you're not going to have a government that is representing you. But you're being hoodwinked. You're being took. You're being conned. You're being swindled. You're being hoodwinked. You're being bamboozled. And so as a result, last year in America, 769 people f died because they fell out of bed. Fifteen new laws were passed for American bed manufacturers to change how beds are constructed, even how high they are off from the ground. But over 12,000 died of gun homicide and over 30,000 died of gun accidents, not a single law. And that's BS. But sometimes, my brothers and sisters, we see as yesterday, when the adults are so locked down with their ideological BS, they're being leveraged by corporations, that BS. Their tr obsession with winning the next election, that BS. Their under-the-table dealings, all of that BS. So much so that the children have to fight their own battle, then fight. Because my reading of history shows that 
When young people get serious about serious things while they're still young, history changes. When young people get serious about serious things while they're still young, history changes. When adults are so blinded, deaf and dumbed and hypnotized by their BS, sometimes God has to lead with a child. Now, see, the reason why I read Isaiah here in the 11th chapter is because he's giving us a picture of when God's Messiah would come. And his kingdom would make some inbreaking into earth, some fragmentary actualization of the kingdom of God, that which is possible in human history given human limitations. That the root of Jesse, Jesse is only used one time in scripture that's referred to the father of David because David was given an eternal throne for which there was no end and Jesus was the ultimate fulfillment of that promise as part of the root of Jesse. Salvation would come to the world of the Jews and the Gentiles through the root of Jesse. And when Messiah would come, you would know because there would be a breaking of the curse of, 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 of uh, the, the curse of Eden. Because you know in the Eden's garden, when man's human, humanity's sin entered the garden, the ground, the sudden that had previously given of its yield uh, effortlessly, now was replete with thorns and thistles, and only by the sweat of his brow would man eke out a living from a stingy earth. In Eden's garden, because of man's sin, now the animals that sat down and lived in harmony without being divided between predators and prey, suddenly, all of a sudden, big, strong, fierce animals preyed upon small and defenseless animals. And now, even the, and then even the human family would be divided between predator and prey, as we would see in the first sons when, when Cain would slew Abel, he would be his brother's killer rather than his brother's keeper. But when God's kingdom would come in some fragmentary break in some momentary break in we would know because the curse of Eden would be broken and the world would become a safe place and it would no longer the human family would no longer be divided between predator and prey between haves and have nots first world and third world nations the strong would not be the burden of the weak but they would bear the burden of the weak and that man's harmony would permeate creation so when man got and one man got right with God man's righteousness Sadiq would translate into righteousness throughout all nature and the wolf would be able to lay down with the lamb because the lamb wouldn't have to run from the wolf and the wolf wouldn't have an appetite for the lamb and the leopard would be able to lay down uh, uh, with, the, with the goat and the goat would not have to fear the, the leopard and the leopard would not have an appetite for the goat and the lion would be able to lay down with the calf and the calf would not have to fear the lion and the lion wouldn't have an appetite for, uh, uh, for the calf and and these were the fierce animals in Palestine in that time. It was the leopard. It was the lion. Uh, it was the wolf. They didn't know anything about, uh, 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 about the cheetah. They didn't know anything about the alligator. They didn't know anything about the tiger. They didn't know anything about the, the black panther. They didn't know anything about those. <laughs> It, it, it was shorthand for all of the bigger, stronger, fierce animals would not prey upon the weaker and defenseless animals, but they would lay down the lion and the lamb. And the ultimate statement from the prophet Isaiah, first Isaiah, the ultimate statement of the breaking of the curse of Genesis was that a child will lead them. A pateon. Jesus said, except you come to me as a child, you shall not enter the kingdom. A child without legal rights, a child without protections of the law a child without entitlements or prerogatives that we would live in a world where the last become first the first become last and that the world would be so safe that even a child could step out and lead because we had take the predator and prey dynamic out of our world that's what he's saying Oh, but when adults get caught up in their BS, lambs don't want to get nowhere near wolves and goats don't want to get anywhere near leopards and calves don't want to be anywhere near lions and halves get no mercy from halves nots and rich get tax breaks that make them richer and poor they want to take away meals on wheels and cut food stamps because there's predators and there's prey. And in that atmosphere, when we abdicate even our responsibility from our most basic obligations to our children, sometimes children have to take upon themselves the responsibility that should be on the adults. 
And I come to tell young people, if the adults will not fight for you, from the president to the politicians to the preachers, maybe even your parents, if they are so mesmerized and anesthetized and blinded and deafened and dumbed by their BS, then you stand up and fight for your doggone self. An army called to arms with your digital weapons, with your cell phones, and with your iPads and your computers. Shame them. Put their voting records on the internet. Show how much money they're taken from their sugar daddy their pimp daddy in our way show who they really are your life is worse to fight because history tells me every now and then when the adults are so caught up in their bs god has to call a child to lead them Oh, come on, you remember the story when the children of Israel and their armies were camped on one side of the valley of Elah and on the other side was the Philistine armies and down in the valley was their champion Goliath, a nine foot nine inch veritable killing machine with state of the arts weaponry, including a spear that they say weighed about 50 pounds at the tip, begging for a champion of Israel to come down to meet him. But they were too coward from Saul on down. David, a 12 year old ready little lad, sent to the battlefield to bring rations for his older brothers who were in Saul's army cowering and capitulating just like everybody else David showed up a prepubescent teen and wondered why in the world y'all standing here letting this uncircumcised heathen condemn and damn the name of your God I will go and fight the giant I can't fight with Saul's army I cannot go with that just give me my slingshot because I believe the God we serve is a giant killer if somebody will just trust him David stepped out there while the adults were caught up in their BS that made them afraid to fight him Saul afraid his brothers afraid but he said you come to me with a sword and a spear I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts and he will give you unto my hands and when David took that slingshot filled with the faith of the giant killing God launched that stone in the air the Holy Ghost cut that smooth stone God Guided it through the aerial dynamics of the mysteries of the power and the counsel of God. Slipped that stone through the one small space right in Goliath's helmet and oops upside your head. And the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Because God is a giant killer. Oh my God. When the French couldn't find a soldier of valor to lead his armies into battle against the English domination, 16-year-old Joan of Arc, who was sent to the city of Orleans under siege, got there on horseback, saw the men capitulating before the English. She mounted a horseback, put on some army, for two years led the French in battle against the English, captured by the English, burned at the stake. In the words of Invictus, she went to her death with her head bloody but unbowed and she rallied the men of French to finally free themselves in the hundred year war the church would canonize her centuries later oh but I come to tell you sometimes when the adults are caught up in their BS God has to send a child to lead them you want to know how we got into discrimination in lunch counters children sat at those lunch counters you want to know how we ended discrimination in interstate travel students from and core got on those buses even though they bombed them you want to know how we got voting rights in the south students came from the north went down south Swerner, Goodman and Cheney and though they were lynched they lit a fire and people said before I be a slave I'll be buried in my grave students marched against the war students marched for women's rights students marched for equal rights students marched for gay rights because sometimes when adults I caught up in their BS God has the sin a child to lead them so I'm calling you to arms to man your weapons woman your weapons and believe that God will make a way somehow because my Bible tells me it was a young adult that was born in Bethlehem raised in Nazareth who went to Jerusalem to pay a debt that he did not owe 
because we had a debt that we could not pay it was a young adult who they lifted high and stretched him wide it was a young adult who they pierced him in the side drove the nails in his hands it was a young adult who laid his head in the locks of his shoulders and said it is finished it was a young adult who they laid in a borrowed tomb sealed the tomb put soldiers outside the tomb but when they came back Sunday morning God had reached down raised up that young man my grandma called him Jesus a wonderful counselor a mighty God a prince of peace an everlasting father I serve a God that is a giant killer have I got a witness touch your neighbor and say neighbor it's a shame we get so caught up in our BS that our children have to fight for themselves I want to say to the children well fight on then harder yet may be the fight right may often yield to might wickedness a while may reign Satan's cause may seem to gain but there is a God that rules above with a powerful arm and a heart of love and he if I'm right, he'll fight our battles. We will be free someday. Free at last. Free at last. Thank God Almighty. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. It's worth the fight. Slap your neighbor again and say, neighbor, it's worth the fight. It's worth the fight. It's worth the fight. See ya!